This video will look a little further into the outputs of a Metropolis Monte Carlo simulation. So once again, looking from my computational chemistry GitHub repository, we got a Jupyter notebook uh, running on that stuff locally here. And this is going to focus on this uh, mc.py, this type of Python uh, toy program I have written for Metropolis Monte Carlo simulations. So it starts by calling this type of mc.py script, where we're uh, going down into this uh, mmlib.simulate module, deep down in this uh, scripts molecular mechanics directory, and then using uh, simulation.run for our Monte Carlo uh, object there. Down inside that molecular mechanics mmlib directory, we have the simulate.py, where once again, uh, we have some uh, classes down in there, and the one of interest is going to be somewhere down, Monte Carlo, down there. And then going to have this run function here, doing the bulk of the heavy lifting, where we have basically uh, at each of these uh, iterations for our configurations, randomly displace the coordinates, get the new energy, compute the change in energy, Boltzmann factor of the relative energy change, compare that to a random number, uh, and if it is above the random number, then we will uh, accept that and uh, get our new energy and uh, check if we need to print anything at that particular step, continue until the end, and then shut everything down. Okay, so we have... Uh, that's going to run on an input like this uh, helium-20 uh, input file, .mc, tell you where the molecule is, what the temperature is, how big our uh, sphere is that these are going to be located inside, how many configurations, how, how often to print the geometry and the energy, what files to print those to, and how often to tell me uh, how far along the status of the simulation is every two seconds here to the command line. And this is just for uh, be able to repeat the simulation the exact same way. If I don't have this here, it'll give me a new random seed, and it'll randomly displace my atoms a completely different way. So this is just so I can repeat this time and again in the exact same random way. All right, that output <clears throat> gives a very similar output to the type of thing that we would expect from molecular dynamics, as we saw in a previous video except for now the first energy term is potential because there is no kinetic energy in Monte Carlo. It, we're just displacing randomly, not according to you know velocities or that kind of stuff, uh, just according to random displacements. So the total energy is the potential energy, the kinetic energy is zero, and we don't have either of those terms, just our standard uh, potential, non-bonded, bonded, boundary, van der Waals, electrostatic, bonds, angles, torsions, and out of planes. And we do that all the way down to the end to our uh, last configuration, if that'll even load. Uh, kind of, not really. All right. And then it's also every so many iterations, looks like every hundred iterations, printing out a new XYZ uh, component of our trajectory that we can load in VMD and take a look at. And then afterwards, I'm going to take this uh, helium20.plot script down in plot Monte Carlo he20.plot, which is going to generate the uh, going to generate the PDF image plots that we're going to take a look at in a minute. All right, so if I run that, I run this uh, scripts molecular mechanics analysis.py or ana.py script. I'm going to do uh, that on that plot file, that plot input. And it's going to give me this nice table to the screen, just as it did for molecular dynamics, summarizing the energy components, average, standard deviation, minimum, maximum of all my terms. And additionally, uh, printing out a PDF of the uh, energy trajectories to that file that I've specified, which we'll take a look at in a moment. Okay, so about 10 examples, it's the same kinds of examples that we looked at for molecular dynamics, except for these are going to be Monte Carlo now, so we'll see some differences. All right, uh, hf.xyz, I believe this one is at fairly low, temp uh, fairly low temperature, so uh, you notice that this doesn't move too much, and that's because 
if they if the bond length is going to get increased a lot or crunched a lot, then you're going to reject that configuration because that'll be a large change in energy. So a lot of times for big bonded structures, that's not very good, or I would have to rewrite it to do uh, translations, rotations, or vibrations separately to do those efficiently for some type of uh, bonded molecule. If I look at uh, carbon monoxide, and then I have this at 298 Kelvin, I believe, over a larger number of configurations, 1,000 instead of 100. Notice it makes a little bit more progress, but still not much to uh, report, not too uh, interesting uh, things going on there in 1,000 configurations. Also water, you can see still not too much going, a little bit of motion, not too much crazy going on. This ethane one is occurring at pretty high temperatures, so we're going to get some fairly odd structures there that are high energy because I think I put this at like 5,000 Kelvin or something ridiculous. So that one moves a little bit more because the temperature is higher, so it's going to accept a lot more high energy structures. You can see that these bonds are you know, quite deformed relative to what we would normally expect our bonds to look like. All right, our formaldehyde, we got an out-of-plane angle there. This is over 400,000 configurations, so it actually does some noticeable movement there. That's pretty much what we got to do, is do an enormous number of configurations to get any kind of uh, significant movement going on out of that. So that's like a frame once every 400 configurations. Actually, if I can... Does it work that way? Yeah, should be clicking on those as we go. Yeah, so we get a significant amount of uh, movement going on there over those uh, hundreds of thousands of configurations just because that's how much it takes when we have to uh, disturb all those bonded structures. Uh, this one is at zero Kelvin, so you'll notice the non-bonded lithium fluoride just attracted through electrostatics and van der Waals. At zero Kelvin, they're pretty much going to snap into place to an equilibrium structure and then they're stuck there because at zero Kelvin we can't go uphill. We can only go downhill and accept energies or and accept structures that go down in energy. So once we snap into that low energy structure, we're pretty much stuck there. All right, helium two. We've got two heliums there starting out pretty close together, and they're inside some type of, I believe, 17 angstrom sphere. So they very quickly just start distributing themselves pretty much entirely throughout the sphere. Uh, this is pretty efficient here because you don't have any bonded elements. It's all non-bonded, and they're going to pretty quickly start exploring the entire space of the volume you've given accessible to them. So for something like a monatomic gas, uh, Metropolis Monte Carlo is a very efficient simulation type and probably even, in fact, more efficient probably than uh, molecular dynamics. Again, simulation is all about the right tool for the right kind of system. You can save yourself tons of work by uh, doing using the right tool for the right job. Uh, helium-20, 20, 20 heliums, starting uh, pretty close together, 298 Kelvin. They very strongly prefer to be a gas and distribute themselves all the way throughout the entire container. Five waters at room temperature are going to prefer to uh, pretty much stay together. They're going to wiggle around a little bit, but for the most part, that structure just stays intact, as it did in molecular dynamics. And our two benzenes, uh, even more atoms, gives us even more opportunity for the structure to be rejected if even one of them jumps uh, to an unfavorable bonded arrangement. So there are even smaller motions there. The bigger your molecules get, the more inefficient uh, this type of M Metropolis Monte Carlo becomes just for naive uh, Cartesian coordinate displacement. I have to start going to some type of uh, internal degrees of freedom where I'm displacing bonds, angles, torsions, uh, and those, types of, those types of things to get any kind of movement out of bigger molecules. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at some uh, PDF graphs of all of these structures now. So um, we can see for... HF, uh, we start off at a high energy, and then going at a low temperature, we very quickly zoom down towards zero. And then this is only over 100 configurations, so it pretty much stays there, very low temperature. 
for carbon carbon monoxide over a thousand configurations. Uh, notice there's a lot more variation. Uh, the bond is free to displace at 298 Kelvin a little bit. We get a couple kcals per mole of energy every now and then. For water, you have the same thing. Bonds and angles can displace over these 10,000 configurations that we looked at for water. For ethane, we have the torsions as well. You can see the torsions down by the baseline here. We had 20,000 configurations there. And then over the 400,000 for our uh, formaldehyde, we actually had some out-of-plane uh, displacement there as well. You can see the gray faintly down by the bottom, but mostly bonds or angles that were jumping up in energy. There's the lithium fluoride, uh, zero Kelvin, immediately jumping down to a low energy structure and staying there. So our, let's see, all of our potential energy here is non-bonded, so it's jumping down to this non-bonded energy being our total energy and just stays right there at zero Kelvin, can't go up. Helium-2 pretty much uh, had no potential energy except for the occasional bounce against the wall that got accepted. Helium-20, more frequently accepted collisions against the wall or more frequently uh, close pair interactions between particles over these about 9,000 or so uh, configurations. And then our five waters, uh, not that different from the type of uh, simulation, from the type of data we got from molecular dynamics. We have the same kind of general trends of these terms, but notice their variations are, are different as far as how those are going to be working. A lot easier for things to quickly redistribute between bonds, angles, or other types of motions when you are just randomly displacing things. And finally, we have our two benzenes, where there wasn't a lot of motion, even over 20,000 configurations, just because... Uh, you needed a large concerted motion for any net displacement in those benzenes.